Good evening. Grab your Bibles and turn over to Matthew chapter 5. It is going to be imperative that you follow along with me uh, because we're going to be looking at blocks of Scripture, but we won't be doing all the reading. But nevertheless, it would, it's going to be easier to kind of uh, keep track of what's going on if, uh, if you have your Bibles out and you're following along. We are actually have come to the end of our series of lessons in the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're just going to backtrack just a little bit and just kind of do an overview uh, and then emphasize what Jesus or what is said of Jesus at the end. And so we have the Beatitudes, the Similitudes, then Jesus came to, to, to fulfill the law. He talks about murder in Matthew chapter 5 verses 20 through 26. In regard to adultery, he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you. And then in regard to divorce, furthermore, whoever divorces and so on, but I say to you in verse 32. In regard to oaths, in verse 33, again, you have heard it said, verse 34, but I say to you. In regard to retaliation, in verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Verse 39, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. And then in verse 43, you have heard that it was said, and verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies. I'm talking about uh, how we should respond. And then charitable deeds and prayer and fasting about wealth and, and priorities and the things of this life in comparison to the righteousness of God. And Jesus speaks definitively. He talks about judging here. And then uh, about uh, prayer, asking, and so on. Uh, the golden rule, as it's oftentimes stated in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, and verse 13 and 14 about the broad way that leads to destruction, the narrow gate that leads to life. And then he gives a warning about false teachers. And in fact, he goes even further to, to say you need to identify them. And that you will know them by their fruits, what they produce. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at tonight. And that's why I want to encourage you to follow along with me. Because we're just going to be hitting kind of the highlights. And he talks about the two ways of life here. That there's the, the, the misgiven way. A, a way that, that we might conclude seemed right to them. And, and in fact, they're, they're arguing with Jesus Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied, cast out demons, done many works in your name? And he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Very, very straightforward, definitive teaching. And of course, what we uh, talked about this morning and what I didn't emphasize which is Jesus' emphasis, because I wanted to kind of uh, approach it at a, a little bit different angle, this idea that we are building. That the man who built his house on the rock, and the man who built his house on the sand. The difference between those two individuals is one heard and obeyed. He built his house on the rock. The one who hears and does not obey has built his house upon the sand. He, he does not have a firm foundation and it will be destroyed. Everything that he's worked for will come collapsing one day. And so it brings us to our study tonight. So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Have you ever talked to someone and they... they tell you their opinion, they're, they're going to give you an answer, but it's just off the top of their head, you might say. And it might be Bible, but they can't show you book, chapter, and verse. They don't say, let's sit down and let's discuss it. They just want to tell you what they believe. Well, we need to be people who are, thus saith the Lord. We need to turn to the Scriptures. And when we turn to the Scriptures and we teach, we preach, we can do it with authority having searched the scriptures, and that doesn't mean we can't be wrong. Please don't, don't misunderstand me, but 
this is our God, right? It is the Word of God. It's not what mommy and daddy said. It's not what we heard from some preacher. It's not what we want to, to believe. Or We go to our authority. And it is a thus say the Lord. It is book, chapter, and verse in the sense that we would read over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. And it's the standard by which we live. Well, what about these scribes and Pharisees? The people could see a difference in Jesus' teaching. They could recognize it. And I think that what they're seeing is genuineness. They also see that it is authoritative. It's firm. It's not going to change based upon what theological approach is made or taught by someone else. And of course, we were going to conclude to kind of let the cat out of the bag. Why is that? First and foremost, Jesus is God. He is the creator of the universe. But it's quite interesting how he interacts with the people. So we'll get to that here in just a moment. But we see the condemnation of the scribes and Pharisees. You see, they did not prove themselves true. And if I want to find out about you, or you want to find out about me, guess who you ask? You ask those closest to them. Go ask someone's child. And you'll find out real quick what they think about their parents. But my point is, is that we can fool a lot of people most of the time. That is very plausible. But those closest to us, they know where our affections. They know where our heart is set. Jesus, being able to read the hearts of people, just smacks them right between the eyes. And we're going to see that that's quite evident. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 23. When I say that Jesus took off the gloves, I hope that you understand what I mean by that metaphor. In Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 1, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So here he is, he is identifying scribes and Pharisees specifically. He's not vague. He's not just saying, you know, there's some people out there. No, he is talking about the religious rulers of the day. Now, a scribe was as close to a lawyer as you could possibly get without being a lawyer in that they just penned the law constantly. Now, if you had any kind of document and you wrote it day in and day out and that was your profession, you think you might know a little bit about that document? Just a little bit? I would think so. Now, you might not be able to put the pieces together and so on, so you know they're faulted on that, but the point is, is that they knew the law, so they were held up in high esteem, especially the Pharisees, in regard to how they uh, conducted themselves and so on. So he's saying the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They sit in, in a, a place of authority and in a judgment seat. And you'll remember Jethro finally told Moses, you're going to kill yourself. You need to delegate some of this judging and not have every case come to you and kind of divide that out, remember? And so, in verse 3, Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. Now, going back to that child, you asked the child about the parent, you know, we can, we can put on a good facade when we're out in public, when we're in front of others. But when we're behind closed doors, and we let our guard down and we really act like we normally would and we do things that we wouldn't do out in public. And that's kind of what I'm saying. 
But taking that into consideration, the scribes and Pharisees, they are putting on this act. I mean an act. He calls them hypocrites over and over. It is so forward in regard to how they are acting. They have fooled all the people. But I think, based upon what Jesus is going to say that we're going to look at, that they can see that Jesus is right. That they, they are able to start recognizing that what they're doing is not how they should be acting. For they bind, we see in verse 4, for they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Oh, they're real good about telling how, how people should live their lives, but they're not doing it. Then they're telling people all the things that they should do and, and uh, the, the, the task that they should be putting on themselves. But you see, they're the manager sitting up in the corner office is giving all the directions giving all, all the commands, but they're not in the trenches. They're not doing it, which is just the opposite of Jesus. And so we conclude they love to exercise authority. They love to tell people how to live their lives, but they weren't doing it correctly. They weren't adhering to their own commands, if you will. And then we see, beginning in verse 5, but all their works they do to be seen by men. Verse 6, they love the best places at feasts, greetings in the marketplaces, it's to be called rabbi in verse 8. And then Jesus gives this instruction, but you do not call, be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Y'all are all supposed to be in this together, you might say. But you see, the Pharisees, the scribes, it was all about them. They wanted the limelight. They wanted to focus on them. And so much so, he gets to the point where he says in verse 11, But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be abased, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So the scribes and the Pharisees, they wanted the limelight, they wanted to be put on a pedestal. They wanted to be admired. They wanted to be looked upon and the oohs and the ahs, if you will, to be treated special. And Jesus is stealing some of that limelight. Jesus is taking a little bit of their thunder. We're going to see that that's quite evident as we keep walking through this text. So, Here's a woe to you in verse 13. So let's begin in verse 13. And I'm just going to go ahead and just put all the points up there so I don't have to keep on hitting the clicker. But woe to you. Now, now he said, you see, in verse 2, he says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. He's not talking to them. He's talking to the crowd, you might say. He's talking to the multitudes and to his disciples. And he's giving them a warning about the scribes and Pharisees. But then we see in verse 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You see, there's some of those scribes and Pharisees right there in the audience. They're right there in this multitude, in this crowd. They're listening. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You see, that's what I'm talking about. He takes off the gloves. And he is just going to beat them to a pulp, you might say, to to try to knock some sense into them, to, to, to make them realize. And we understand what a woe, uh, there's an idea of a woe is to stop. Whoa, you say to the horse, right? When it starts running wild, whoa, you want it to stop. The other type of woe is the warning. You, you better listen up. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You, you see, they want to have control. Verse 14, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He's already said that. And he's going to say it again. 
For you devour widows' houses and so on. They're money hungry. They want all the attention. This pretense. They make long prayers. Look at me. Look how righteous I am. Look how holy I am. They want to be praised. Verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. You make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. I mean, he's taking off the gloves and he's got steel toed boots and he's kicking them. Do you understand what he's saying here? He just said they're of the devil. This isn't the only place he said it. Notice in verse 16, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whosoever swears by the temple, they're liars. What they're doing is, is the idea that you know, they're, they're making a promise, but they're crossing their fingers behind their backs. In other words, they don't have to keep the promise because they cross their fingers. But they, they would swear by something that they have absolute no control over. And the truth of the matter is, is that they didn't plan to keep the promise at all. The oath, the commitment. And Jesus addressed that in the Sermon on the Mount. So they are blind guides in verse 24. Who strain out the gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and hypocrites, in verse 25. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside are full of extortion and self-indulgence. You look good on the outside, but you're not. He's talking directly to these individuals. In verse 27, we see, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you, like, you are like whitewashed tombs. You, know, you look pretty on the outside, just like that cemetery over there. And you can keep the grass clean, you can put up flowers and everything, but inside are dead men's bones. There are decaying and rotting bodies. And that's exactly what he's saying they are like on the inside. In verse 29, beginning, they were just uh, guilty. They were just, I need to go ahead and turn the, the next one. Um, they were just as guilty as their fathers for murdering the prophets. You see, they say, if we were back then, we wouldn't have done that. You and I, in our arrogance, could say, well, if I lived back then, I would have believed Jesus and I wouldn't have forsaken and I wouldn't this, and I wouldn't that. And we could talk big. But we may not have believed Jesus either. In fact, we could have been some of these religious rulers that all we do is just bow up when he starts saying this kind of stuff. So, ultimately, what was going to happen is that Jesus is that prophet promised by God over in Acts chapter 3 it's spoken of by Peter in a sermon that you need to hear him right that they nailed to the cross you see they said if we lived back then we wouldn't have done what our forefathers did and he says in verse 31, Therefore you are witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents. <laughs> When's the last time someone called you a snake? That's what he's saying. Snakes, serpents, brood of vipers, a poisonous snake, no, no less. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. You say, we wouldn't have done that. But Jesus sees right through them and knows good and well they're going to be just as guilty. In fact, they're going to be guilty of crucifying the Son of God. Verse 
verse 36, And surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, going back to this idea of Matthew chapter 7, and verses 28 and 29, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes, which piques our interest. Well, how did the scribes teach? The scribes could only teach secondhand at best, just like me. I, I could only teach secondhand. I sit in an office, in a study, and I bury my nose in the book, and I try to connect the dots, and I try to understand, and I pray, and I dig, and I formulate, and I put things together, hopefully in such a manner that it's understood. But I'm still, at best, still grasping for straws. I, I, I'm still trying to understand God's Word. And I, that'll be the case till I die. Now there's some things that, yeah, I can, I can speak definitively. And you know, those are some of those things that you can do also. There are some things that you can speak with authority because you know them inside and out, right? Whatever that subject may be, whatever that vocation may be, you know it from front to back. You ever talk to someone that doesn't have quite that understanding? And it doesn't take long to realize they think they know more than they really do? And I've used the example before that way back in the day, I talked a lot on the CB. And I can tell you about SWRs, sound wave ratios. Uh, I can tell you what link you got to cut that coax and so on. And I can tell you this and tell you that and so on and so forth. And you talk to someone, there's some people that they talked on the CB and that's okay. They talked on the CB, but they never had taken it to another level. But I'll tell you one level I never took it to, and that was a ham radio. I never learned uh, Morse code and so on like you had to back in the day. And so those guys were definitely a step above me. So I might think I know something. I didn't really know all that much when it really came to uh, a radio operator. Right? And so my understanding of what is being expressed there at the end of Jesus' sermon is that when you want to talk about someone who knew it frontwards and backwards, inside and out, it was Jesus. He wrote the book. And here you've got some people who are still trying to figure out, and they're going to keep that to themselves because they're going to come across with a facade as if they have it all figured out. They have all the answers. When in fact they don't. So when someone's sitting there and they're listening to Jesus and he speaks with authority, well, no kidding, he wrote the book again, and here's the scribes, and they're putting on an act. And really, when that act, when it's being put on, it's really not a, thus saith the Lord. It's not turned to such and such, and let's, let me explain this to you. It was just kind of talking off the top of their head. And we know people that that's what they do. They really don't know the Bible. And so they, they struggle, and sometimes you can see right through that. So turn over with me to Mark chapter 11. Here's another block of scriptures that I want you to walk through with me. And, and we, we, we see Jesus teaching... And now we're going to see his interaction with the people, if you will. And, and also, certainly, his teaching. We're not going to be overlooking that. But we're going to go through chapter 11 and chapter 12. We're going to do it quite quickly. But I want you to remember here, uh, this is at the, the end of Jesus' ministry. And he's going to cleanse the, the temple. And so this begins in verse 15. But in verse 17... Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it 
a den of thieves. Now notice in verse 18. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. So here again we have this astonishment just like we read over in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28 that the people were astonished at his teaching. Now we know this story that he makes these whips and he drives out the money changers. You want to talk about some authority and exercising that authority, right? So he cleanses the temple in Mark chapter 11 Beginning in verse 27. Notice. Then they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Now he just got through running the money changers out of the temple. And they're saying, hey, who told you you could do that? In essence. And who gave you this authority to do these things. But Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one question. Then answer me. And I will tell you what by what authority I do these things. You answer me, and then I'll give you my answer. So his, his question is, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. I want an answer, Jesus said. And they play dumb. You know these scriptures. Because if they reason to themselves, if they say that he was a prophet, then he's going to say, well, then why didn't you listen to him? But if they say he's just a man, then they're going to fear the crowd. You see, it's all political. It's all about making themselves look good. So what do they do? They say, we do not know. You see... The creator just absolutely taking control and manipulating the situation. And he dumbfounds them over and over and over. And that's part of what I want to share with you tonight. That's part of the astonishment. So he answered and said to Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You're not going to give me a straight answer? I'm not even going to waste my time with you. I'm not going to give you a straight answer either. Now the parable of the vineyard owner. Remember this, this parable? We're not going to spend the time reading it. So the, the vineyard owner lives in another state. He lives in another country. He lives far off. And so he, he has these vine dressers that they take care of the place. And he sends, the, 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 the owner, the vineyard owner sends men to go and you know, get the money and so on, uh, what he's going to receive from his business. And what do they do? They kill. They threw stones at him in verse 4. They wounded him, left him shamefully treated. They sent another, killed him, beat others, killed some. And so he reasons and says, well, I'll send my son and they'll respect him. In verse 8, and they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? In verse 9. He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now notice in verse 12. And they sought to lay hold of him but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. They were able to put two and two together. They understood exactly what he was saying. They were the vine dressers that are killing the people sent by the owner. The owner, of course, is God. Jesus is the son, but they're going to kill him. Jesus knew what they were going to do. And they knew what they were plotting. The question about taxes. You know, they're trying to trick him. 
Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? So he says, well, show me a coin. So they show him a coin. There's Caesar. He says, render to Caesar what, what is Caesar's and to God what is God. They're trying to trick him, but they're not going to have any success. You see, because if they say, if he says Rome, you, you better pay things to Rome, then, well, now he has an allegiance to Rome. If you say God, oh, then that can go run to Caesar and say, he's saying, you don't have to pay taxes to you, Caesar. You need to kill him. You need to take care of him. So the question about the Pharisees. It might help if I go ahead and give you these references. In verse 18, I said Pharisees, I meant Sadducees. What is the whole deal about the Sadducees? It says it right there in the text. Are you following along? So we're in... Mark chapter 12 and verse 18. Then some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and they asked him. They didn't believe in the afterlife and they don't believe in angels. But what are they asking him about? They're asking him about this woman who marries seven guys at the end in eternity. Whose wife will she be out of all these seven guys? And Jesus' response says... Are you not there? You, excuse me, you are, are, let me start all over, verse 24. Are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? These are religious rulers, very pious individuals. And Jesus says, you're mistaken. You're wrong. There is not going to be any marriage in heaven. So, we see in verse 28, Then one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? So Jesus gives him the answer, of course. And that is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribes said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as yourself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So it seems like this guy's he is certainly acknowledging that Jesus answered correctly. I don't know that he's viewing Jesus as the Son of God. But notice in verse 34. So when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. He didn't condemn everyone. In this circumstance, he's saying, you're not far from it. It would seem that this individual has somewhat of a good heart. But notice it says in verse 34, and after that, no one dared question him. Jesus sees right through him. He knew him. Then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple in verse 35, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? See, Jesus has a few questions of his own. It's a good way to teach. Now, if you say that it's faith only, then why do you say you have to repent? If it's faith only, why do you insist that you have to confess? That's a legitimate question. And in, in the same vein, Jesus is going to ask a question because he's dealing with the Son of Man and the Son of God, one and the same. For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, so this is the Holy Spirit speaking through David, inspired, the Lord said to my Lord. David is saying, the Lord said to my Lord. Now, we understand that. We can wrap our minds around it. So God the Father is saying to Jesus Christ, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How 
is he then his son? I mean, what father would call his son Lord? That's not going to happen. The king does not call his son the prince, the almighty one. It says in verse 37, and the common people heard him gladly. You know, they're soaking this up. Whereas the scribes and Pharisees, they're constantly looking for a way to trick him, to try to find some way to get him, some way to find fault. You can't do that with God. That's an impossibility. So he says in verse 38, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense have long prayers. Same thing that we were reading a while ago over in Matthew chapter 23. Beware. Watch out. I, I believe that he is really opening their eyes to see these people, the common people, to see these Pharisees, scribes, leaders for who they really are. Frauds. Absolute frauds. That's why he's dealing with false prophets at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's why that when he spoke, he spoke with authority because he is God. And that's exactly how we'll end the lesson. All things were made through the Word. In John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was full of truth. <laughs> you want to talk about someone knowing the Bible from forward to backward? It was certainly Jesus. We know at the age of 12, he's sitting with some of these uh, religious leaders and he's asking them questions and they are asking him questions. He studied. He had to fight for it. He had to work on it. I believe that he had to, just like you and I, to study. And he learned it. And he applied it. He obeyed it. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 beginning, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. They didn't want to believe Jesus. They didn't want to believe his claim of who he was. They wanted to test him. They wanted to try him. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to find some kind of fault in him. And it was to the point that he could do nothing right. It's far from what we would read over in Hebrews chapter 1. Beginning in verse 8. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And that's who they're contending against. 
So it's no wonder that when the creator of the universe speaks, there were those who were listening. There were those who opened their ears. You, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years shall not fail. That's the God that we serve. Can you imagine being the individual who started a company from scratch and built it up to a multi-billion dollar company, and then you have some young punk come along and tell you how you ought to do business. Just right out of school, they hadn't even gone to school, paint your own picture. How long would you bear with that individual before you just go, leave me alone, go, go away. I've got work to do. It's amazing to me how much Jesus put up with these religious leaders and their pompous, arrogant, selfish, all indulgence attitude. In Hebrews chapter 2, in four, verse 14, beginning, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation, atonement, sacrifice for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus went much further than just tolerating their rudeness and their intolerance of him to the point that he went to the cross. And he says from the cross, from those who are blaspheming his name, spitting at him, doing all kinds of vile things to him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And the second we say I wouldn't have done that. That wouldn't have been me. I wouldn't have been. We better watch it. Because we can be just as guilty as Peter. I won't deny you. I'll die for you. And hours later, <laughs> he's denying me. To be Thomas, ready to go to Jerusalem and die. Because he knew it was a death sentence to go to Jerusalem and expose themselves because these people... These scribes and Pharisees were after them. But then later, he says, until I can put my hand into his side, my fingers into the prints of his hands, I'm not going to believe. What a Savior we serve. He, he teaches. He instructs. He passes on truth. That's everlasting. And you and I are still just, we're still the ones who would stand at the foot of the cross and say, crucify him. Yet he still died for us. We're the ones that would mock. We're the ones that would test. We're the ones that would say, oh yeah? Well, what do you have to say about <laughs> in our arrogant, all-knowing minds.
Jesus spoke with authority because he has all authority. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the end of, even to the end of the age. Amen. Do we respect Jesus? Are we the Martha that's so busy in our everyday lives? Therefore, we're building our house on the sand. Or are we the, the Mary that's sitting at the feet of Jesus? Hanging on every word that he has to say. Do we really give him all authority over our lives? Colossians 3 and verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do we really recognize his authority in treating in, in regard to who he is, the creator of the universe? Not our bud. Not our go-to guy when we need to get out of a tough situation. But that we truly are a living sacrifice. Honoring him and serving him. Respecting him. Loving him. Obeying him. And that's our challenge. I hope that you've enjoyed this, this study. Uh, it's taken us over a year, uh, close to a year and a half to go through it. But uh, certainly could have had a few other lessons along the way. But may Jesus receive the respect that he deserves and that we give him that open ear as that promised prophet. Because if we don't, there will be the ultimate price to pay. Since I alluded to it, and I've already spent so much time, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 22, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall come to pass that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. We don't want that. So we're going to listen. And we're going to obey. We're going to be those who build on that foundation because we heard and we obeyed that foundation of Jesus Christ, a rock that will be immovable. And so Jesus taught with authority and it's exactly how we need to live our lives if there's any way that we can help you as we come to a close of this service if you want to be baptized to start that journey to submit to him as your master or if you need the prayers of the congregation won't you make that